Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts, a free educational netcast bringing geology to all. In this episode, I want to talk about fossil identification, how to recognize a fossil and try to determine, based on looking at it, what kind of organism it was in life. If it was a sponge or a trilobite or a coral or a fish or a plant or one of many other forms of ancient life that have become preserved in sedimentary rock. It's not going to be comprehensive, but I want to talk about some of the major groups of fossils that are most commonly found. Fossils are classified like living organisms using the Linnaean system, and an expert in paleontology would be able to identify fossils down to the species level, at least in their own area of expertise. But we're not going to worry about that level here. We're going to be looking at the level more of recognizing a fossil for what form of life it represented. What phylum did it belong to? What major category of animal life did it belong to? Sometimes even a better classification than that based upon details is possible. And we're going to start with trilobites. Trilobites belong to the phylum Arthropoda. They are arthropods. Other arthropods that you're familiar with are insects, spiders and other arachnids, millipedes, centipedes, lobsters, crabs, shrimp. Animals that are classified as having segments, as having an exoskeleton, and of having jointed appendages on either side of the body. Trilobites are a group of organisms that were very successful and abundant at one time on Earth. In the Cambrian period in particular, is almost sometimes known as the age of trilobites because they became so abundant and diverse then. And they survived until the end of the Paleozoic era. But they went extinct at the end of the Paleozoic and going into the Triassic period from the Permian period, there are no more trilobites in the world. These are some of the most iconic fossils, and you can find them often in rock shops or in jewelry shops because they look so interesting. They, they have a very insectoid appearance. And you can recognize a trilobite because it has three characteristic body parts. This is normal for all trilobites, although individuals can look pretty flamboyant sometimes. All trilobites have a frontal part of their body, the head part, where you find the prominent eyes. And we call this part of the body the cephalon. Behind the cephalon are these stacked segments of the body, close segments almost like the segments in a centipede or a millipede's body. We call this the thorax, the main part of the body. At the very end of the body, it's not a tail, it's a small plate, and we call this the pygidium. In fact, trilobite literally means a body of three lobes trilobes, trilobite, because of the cephalon, thorax, and pygidium. Trilobites live in the oceans of our world at one time, and they were exclusively marine. They preserve really well in the fossil record where they used to occur because their shells are really strongly reinforced by calcite crystalline plates. Modern crustaceans, like crabs and lobsters, have plates that are more made of chitin, interwoven with small crystallites of calcium carbonate. But with trilobites, it was much more like armor plating, heavy armor plating. Trilobites essentially would scuttle Along the bottom. Their undersides are often not preserved in the fossil record, but when they are, it reveals that they had rows of pointy legs, and they would travel along the seabed on the bottom in a way very similar to modern horseshoe crabs. And modern horseshoe crabs resemble the visual impression you get from a trilobite when you look at it, but they are not closely related. They're also arthropods, but they're distantly related from the trilobite group. Another common group of fossil life form includes the brachiopods. Brachiopods belong to their own phylum, phylum Brachiopoda or Brachiopoda. Brachiopods are a diverse group, and they're still around. They're not extinct, but their diversity is fairly limited nowadays. They used to be, in the Paleozoic, a lot more abundant and a lot more diverse. And they included species that were highly motile, that is, they moved around, they could swim like a scallop, and species that were essentially sessile, reef-building organisms that would spend their lives rooted in one spot, grown into the substrate. To many people, brachiopods look superficially like mollusks. That's not unjustifiable, because brachiopods have have two valves or two shells. But unlike a mollusk, a bivalve mollusk, which has two valves of the same size and they form a left and a right, brachiopods form a shell that is larger slightly than the other shell, the other valve. One hinges over the other like a treasure chest opening and closing. It sounds like a technical difference, but they are forms of life in completely different phylums. Clams are in a phylum mollusca. They are mollusks. Very different from brachiopods. And the reason you've probably never seen them before in the real world is because they don't show up in butcher shops or seafood shop like clams do. Clams have a muscular foot because they're a mollusk. If you open up a brachiopod, there is no muscular foot at all. There's no muscle that you would eat. Instead, what you see is a lacy structure that can unfold when the organism is alive and collect food particles from passing seawater currents. Brachiopods are all marine. They all live in seawater, and they are filter feeders. They extend what is called a lophophore, a specialized 
filter feeding structure that essentially allows for small particles of plankton and food to stick. And then the brachiopod rolls the lophophore back into its shell where it digests the food. Its internal anatomy is completely different from that of a mollusk. Echinoderms are another common group of fossil invertebrate life from ancient oceans. They belong to phylum Echinodermata, which literally means spiny skin. And a characteristic of the echinoderms is that they have a heavily mineralized skeleton of calcium carbonate, and therefore they tend to fossilize easily. Echinoderms are a phylum that are closely related to our own phylum chordata. But whereas we have bilateral symmetry, the echinoderms tend to have five-fold symmetry. And we're familiar with them as sea stars, sea urchins, sand dollar, brittle stars, and they feature prominently in our oceans today. In the past, they were at times even more abundant, and throughout, for example, the Carboniferous period and the Devonian period. These times included vast undersea meadows of crinoids, which are a kind of echinoderm that you're not probably familiar with because they're not very common in today's ocean. But in the ancient past, crinoids were a kind of echinoderm that could form meadows that would cover vast areas of the seabed shallow, sunlit, tropical seas. Crinoids are unique in that they had a long structure that the body would build to attach itself to the seabed. And most of the animal's body would be up in the water column with arms that are projecting out into the water collecting food particles, like a filter feeder. Some formations of limestone rock are essentially made almost entirely of crinoid material that reflect passing ages of reef development and growth, where successive generations of crinoids leave behind their hard parts remains as calcium carbonate granular material, eventually forming an entire body of limestone rock. Usually when you encounter crinoid fossils in limestone, you see them most commonly as individual disks or stacks of disks. It used to be part of the columnar tissue structure that the crinoid would build to attach itself to the seabed. After it died, these disks, this stacked disk column structure, would just disarticulate and fall apart. Individual crinoid columnar disc pieces look like a piece of Lifesavers candy in general structure. It's a rounded disc with a hole through the middle, which is where the living tissue of the crinoid would have passed when the animal was alive. Mollusks are another group of animals that produce shells that tend to fossilize and be preserved easily in both the ocean and in freshwater conditions. Mollusks appeared in the fossil record in the Cambrian period and have been successful throughout the entire Phanerozoic eon. And today, we're familiar with the beaches of the world being littered with mollusk shells. Mollusks produce shells of calcium carbonate. The major groups of mollusks you're likely to encounter in the fossil record are bivalve mollusks, gastropod mollusks, and cephalopods. Bivalve mollusks are the ones you're familiar with as clamshells. They have two valves, two shells of equal size, forming a left and a right. And a muscular foot is how the animal propels itself along the bottom or clapping through the water like a scallop can swim briefly. And often they would simply use it to dig into the substrate to gather food particles. Gastropod mollusks have coiled shell. And in fact, when you think of a seashell and you're not thinking of a clamshell, what you're probably imagining is a gastropod mollusk shell. And they're very common today. After the Permo-Triassic extinction about 250 million years ago, Gastropods became a lot more abundant in the fossil record, and they remain abundant ecologically today. They're very diverse and very successful, enjoying a wide range of feeding lifestyles, including filter bottom feeders all the way to major predators. Another common group of mollusk fossils you can encounter are ammonoids and belemnoids. These are animals that are a cousin group to modern-day nautilus, the chambered nautilus. Although the chambered nautilus is not an ammonoid, it's a separate group of mollusks. The ammonoids are all extinct, as are the belemnoids. Ammonoids are characteristically recognizable as being coiled, shelled mollusks, but the coil is in one direction around a single axis, and so you form like a wheel-like structure, usually. They're very visually striking, commonly found in rock and mineral shops. Ammonoids have coiled shells, and belemnoids are similar to them, but have a straight shell, like a pen. Their shells protected a squid-like body with tentacles and eyes projecting out of one end of the shell. They were extremely successful in their time. They played the ecological role basically of fish, although fish coexisted with them in the ocean. Ammonoids, belemnoids, and other cephalopods like squids and octopuses are notable because they're fairly intelligent animals. As mollusks go, they're smart, they can solve problems, they have complex eyes, as complex as ours. They're interesting creatures, and it's unfortunate that all the ammonoids are gone, because shoals of them once filled the world's oceans. And they were successful through the Permo-Triassic extinction, when most life died out about 250 million years ago, and yet they died about 
about 66 million years ago in the extinction that brought about the end of the large dinosaurs. They were successful for a very long time in our oceans, very diverse and probably delicious. A lot of the fossil record that we get from the ancient oceans of our world comes from reef building organisms. Organisms that at least spend part of their life, and in some cases their entire life, as a sessile or non-moving organism that is planted at the bottom or planted on the seabed surface in some way, attaches itself and grows from there. Many coral building organisms reinforce protective skeletons around their soft fleshy tissue by constructing hard parts of calcium carbonate or silica or calcium phosphate. Although on our planet, for the most part, reef building organisms make use of calcium carbonate. The dissolved components are very abundant in ocean water and it's fairly easy to evolve the capacity to make such skeletal components. The fossil record of coral reefs in sedimentary rocks goes back to the Cambrian period when the earliest coral reefs were quite simple and composed primarily of algae forming lumpy structures called stromatolites, which are basically algal mats cemented by their own sticky mucus to collect sediment particles and then solidify layer upon layer, building up a nodule-like structure. And sponges. Early coral reefs in the Cambrian and early Paleozoic were dominated by sponges. Today's sponges are a minor player in reef building, but in the early Cambrian, archaeocyathid sponges grew to become a dominant member of reef building community. By the Ordovician and Silurian periods, coral reef communities became even more complex, including groups such as the tabulate corals and stromatoporoids. Tabulate corals are a group that are extinct today. They only lived during the Paleozoic era. And their corals are distinctive because the individual polyps would live in little cups along what would essentially be the top of a wall that they would build. And a tabulate coral structure looks very boxy, uh, almost like towers uh, nested within each other, or like a honeycomb. Tabulate corals belong to Phylum Cnidaria. And Phylum Cnidaria, the Cnidarians, actually account for most of what you'd call corals in the modern era. Octocorals, Hexacorals are all cnidarians, so are sea anemones, hydra, and sea jellies, or jellyfish. Those are all in the same phylum. And for most of the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, the coral reef building on our planet has been mostly by cnidarians. They take up most of the heavy lifting in that ecological role. Stromatoporoids were heavy, bulbous, shield-like coral structures that appear to have been in phylum Porifera. They were sponges, like our chiocyathids before them. Stromatoporoids are extinct today. They died out in the late Mesozoic era. Another group of fossil cnidarians are the rugose corals, or rugosins, sometimes more technically called the tetracoral. They're all extinct today. They died out at the end of the Permian period. Rugose corals I've mentioned in a previous episode because they actually have use in allowing us to determine how many days were in a year during the Paleozoic because they laid down daily growth bands. Rugose corals were solitary to colonial coral polyps in the phylum cnidaria, and individual rugose corals could grow up to 10-20 centimeters in length as an individual horn of calcium carbonate. It would support an individual large polyp. Other rugose corals are colonial and essentially are the same physical structure, but instead of forming a single horn of coral, a colonial mass of many polyp seats or septi. An individual septum is where an individual coral polyp grows. Rugose corals are highly distinctive in appearance. They're pretty common in Paleozoic rocks, and they're one of the easiest fossils to collect because they tend to weather out of their limestone post rock intact fairly often. The state fossil of Michigan is what's called Petoskey stone, named after a city in Michigan where these stones, these fossils, wash up on the shore of Lake Michigan. Petoskey stones are basically lumps of rugose colonial coral, weathered out and pounded by water action into rounded cobbles. They're quite attractive, and in water or when they're wet, they clearly show the sutures between individual polyps in the original coral colony. Rugose corals all died out at the end of the Permian period, about 252 million years ago. And what happened after that was an ecological collapse. The end Permian extinction took out upwards of 95% plus of biodiversity on Earth. And afterward, entirely new groups evolved. When we go into the Triassic, we see that rugose corals, tabulate corals, stromatoporoids are all gone. And in their place, among other organisms to have evolved, include the scleractinian coral. And today, modern corals, when you see corals in reefs, octocorals and hexacorals, are all different kinds of scleractinians. In fossil hand sample, you can tell scleractinians from rugose corals because they have distinctive septi and the rugose corals have bilateral symmetry. They look like a horn, but if you look at that in cross-section, 
there's a left and a right hand side there that are identical. If you look at scleractinian corals, they have radial symmetry. Also, it helps to know the age of the rocks you're looking at. Rugose corals, tabulates, stromatoproids, they're all Paleozoic, whereas scleractinians don't show up in the fossil record until the Triassic, after the Permo-Triassic extinction in a whole new world.